Welcome to Discovering. We're hopping on a ferry to Drummond Island to check out the Great Lakes Traditional Arts Gathering. This is a, a, a chance to learn some skills that you probably won't find anywhere else. Daisy Costas, who is an elder of the James Bay Cree. This year, um, Daisy's doing rabbit skin blankets. We also have Ferdy Good here. He's built over 60 birch bark canoes. This year, he's building a moose skin boat. Sit back, put your feet up, and come on along. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf. Lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Go east from anywhere in the UP and you'll end up at Detour Village. Hop on the ferry, cross Detour Passage and you're on Drummond Island. We wanted to be on an island because when you go to an island and you cross that ferry, you have a mental separation from everyday life and from your normal routine. And suddenly you're on an island and it just so happens that at this spot there is absolutely no cell phone coverage. Tucked away in a quiet cove on the shores of Lake Huron, you'll find a group of very unique artists come together once a year for an event called the Great Lakes Traditional Arts Gathering. This event was started by myself and the executive director of the Great Lakes Lifeways Institute. His name is Kevin Finney. And we started it in 2012. So this will be the third year. The event is a total of five days. Starts Wednesday evening with class signups for Thursday. The core of the event is Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And each evening, we sign up for the following day's activities. What we offer here is the chance to learn a lot of very rare, difficult to access skills. You only need the skirt until each nut gets um, cracked, and then they stop jumping. And so, let's check. We have instructors from many walks of life and many areas of expertise, but I'd say that the, one of the binding threads of all of the instructors is that they are either tradition bearers or professionals or very knowledgeable in a subject. For instance, we have Barry Keegan this year doing stone tools. Looking to make, you know, this would be good for arrowheads. So te teaching them the angles and how to prepare the edges and all the tricks to getting getting these flakes successfully one after the other. The round side is up and the flat side down. You need to round off the flat side so you go all the way around it. You see the flakes went a little distance in. By the time I make three full passes all the way around it, the flakes go further and further in. And then this this has more of a lens shape just like this side does. In between each set of flakes, you abrade it a little bit to give it strength. That gives you more, lets the flakes travel a further distance because they're bigger. You can see how the flakes are traveling in a little bit further. They, they've made it to this line, but the next time they'll make it to the middle and hopefully I can do the same from this side. If I want to remove, let's say that, that little trouble spot, you nibble away the edge so it's closer to the problem. See how it drops like a smile shape? And then I'll really grind that up with my eyes shut. The longer flakes you get are the ones that you take off of a ridge. It just makes the side flatter and flatter and flatter. So it's getting closer. This is this has come in here, this has come in a lot here. But I've still got some of the flat in here and a lot of the flat in here to get rid of.
There's a next good strong ridge right here. I'm trying to set up another platform to take a larger flake off of it. It's getting closer. It's starting to look like something. Right now the point still kind of dips a little bit. So I'll focus on the tip some right now. I'm gonna try to get that one to go just about to the center if I can. It's starting to get that shape. That's probably where I'd quit with the stone and then sit down and use a lever tool to take the smaller flakes and finish it up. Right now the edge is a little bit wobbly here and it's all beveled down to this side. So I'd take a set of flakes off to bring it up so that it's centered. One of the things that we look for in instructors are people who not only specialize in a skill, but who really have a deep understanding of nature and of the processes and materials and technologies in their ecosystems. We also have Ferdy Good here. And Ferdy is a, is a master canoe maker. He's built over 60 birch bark canoes, at least one spruce bark canoe that he built la here last year at GL Tag. We actually went out peeled the tree here on the island, brought the bark back, and in the matter of three days built a floating spruce bark canoe. This year, by his own suggestion, because it's something he's wanted to do, he's building a moose skin boat. We're really fortunate to have Ferdy here because he, he's, he's a top-notch instructor. We decided to take it on as a challenge. Uh, moose hide canoe hasn't been built for a long time. With the simple tools like, like the ax here, for uh, hewing the, uh, the wood pieces on the canoe, uh, primarily birch saplings were used to uh, fashion all the wood components, uh, the sheathing and the gunnels, and also uh, the ribstock was all done with yellow birch and white birch. Those were cut and trimmed with the, uh, the mokotagan. The mokotagan is uh, the crooked knife, and it is the, the canoe maker's knife. It's pulled towards the user so that you can manicure your wood pieces and fine tune the different parts of the wood, peel the bark off, do whatever trimming is necessary. Fine tuning the ribs, white birch saplings, bent by eye over the knee. No steam, no hot water, just using the natural flex of the wood and shaving it down so that it has a nice even taper. These are real old-fashioned tools handmade by native people for many, many hundreds of years. Once they acquired the main ingredient, a piece of steel, to make the tool. Prior to that, everything was bone and stone. But to keep in the theme, I still got a real nice antler bone handle on this tool here. This is called babiche. Babiche is uh, rawhide string. Uh, once you cut deer hide, rawhide, moose hide, caribou hide, or whatever into strings, it becomes babiche, and the babiche is used to tie and lash the canoe together. Uh, to puncture the holes, we use a simple awl that is fashioned from an old file, and a handle is, is hafted onto it, and it allows us to puncture into the moose hide and uh, do the lashing to make the attachments to uh, the actual uh, gunnel assembly and also uh, close the ends and attach it to the bottom frame of, of the moose hide canoe also. So with just a few tools and a lot of energy, you can come up with a moose hide canoe. So the first thing we did was make the bed and uh, that gave us a, a very good uh, location to work on, uh, a cleaner area to work on versus working in the sand or the dirt here, you know. And once we had the bed made from uh, balsam fir boughs, then we, uh, we laid out the moose hides, uh, brought them up from the lake, and looked them over very carefully and tried to figure out how we're going to piece them together. Yeah. And that was, uh, that took quite a while, considering that none of us have built a moose hide canoe before, of course. This is the hair side of the moose hide canoe. This is the waterproof side of the canoe. The other side is the flesh side. So uh, this canoe should not leak. A well-made canoe does not leak. So we consider this a, a very well-made canoe, so we'll keep working at it until it does not leak. That's the goal. <laughs> so once we, we got them all pieced together and had kind of like a blanket of moose hides, then we were able to uh, lay down 
the uh, the gunnel assembly. Needs it to get his oil out of the and uh, and begin uh, attaching it, bringing the moose hide up around the assembly and uh, poking holes uh, again uh, with the awl and, and attaching it to uh, to the framework. Uh, once that was complete, we were able to uh, begin sheathing the bottom again with uh, the birch saplings. Uh, once those were in, we could start shaving the ribs down with a crooked knife, the mukatagan, and uh, bend those over the knee, flexing them over the knee a little bit at a time uh, until they came out with a real nice curve and then place them in the canoe, cut them to length, drive them underneath the gunnels and move on to the next one. Uh, there's uh, 22 birch ribs in this moosehide canoe here today. We also have Daisy Costas, who is an elder of the James Bay, James Bay Cree, and Daisy is a wealth of knowledge. She grew up living in the bush, a hunting and gathering lifestyle, going seasonally from place to place, traveling by birch bark canoe. She had a pet crow growing up. This year, um, Daisy's doing rabbit skin blanket. We had probably six people who came to this event just to learn to make rabbit skin blankets because it is such a difficult to find art form and not a lot of people are doing it. What we did here is uh, we're making a rabbit skin blanket. We had to skin the rabbits and, uh, and then after we skinned the rabbits, then we had to strip the, uh, you know, the, uh, the pieces of, uh, of, the, you know, of, of the rabbit skin. It's a long process, you know, from beginning to the end. The yarn part is, the, is about the, you know, is about the, the longest part. And then, and then after that, then, uh, and then you spin it. And uh, the spinning part, you know, it doesn't take that long, maybe 15 minutes at, at the most to spin, a, you know, just a piece of yarn, maybe a piece of uh, yarn about six feet, you know, long. And then once it's spun then, then, you know, then uh, you go ahead and, and weave it through. And, uh, and what I use is like a loop you know, like a, a chain loop all the way through and then all the way back. And I just go back and forth and loop each, each piece. And you have to do this by feel, because the, the loops are hidden underneath that fur, so you have to kind of feel around where those loops are. Some of them are really tight because the, uh, the, uh, the yarn is starting to, starting to harden a little bit, it's drying, and that takes a little, a little bit longer to get, to get the needle through through the ones that have been, that are kind of dry. And this one probably is going to be like a, a baby size blanket, but you can make, uh, you know, you know the uh, double size bed, you can make queen size, you can make king size. You know, growing up, I saw a lot of king size ones, you know, that we, you know, that we used and, you know, we all were able to sleep together, you know, as kids. After it's all made then to, you know, to preserve it, you know, it's got to be nice and dry, you know, before you put it into another, an, an, like a sheet. You can use flannel sheet or you can use cotton and make it into like a quilt. Mm -hmm. and, and then you could use it for a long, long time. We, know, we have Jan Zender this year and he is building a traditional toboggan. Toboggans are a wonderful thing. The toboggan is um, just a fantastic way to haul a load in the wintertime. It's a really important historic technology and a traditional art in its own right. In my mind, toboggans aren't for sliding downhill, but they're for getting your stuff in and out from your house. Or, uh, In fact, like we live three miles from the road in the wintertime, so there were times where we hauled our groceries, our children, and our laundry you know, on toboggans with maybe dogs or something. And so what's going on here is the process of making a toboggan. And of course, that was a traditional Indian mode of winter transportation. And I kind of see toboggans as winter canoes, um, you know, and it kind of has that little bit shape, gets narrower at the top and the bottom. And um, we started with a log and then we split it in half and then in quarters. And then in the bottoms of those quarters, we split out three boards. And so we bent those boards with just hot water. Um, they have some big cauldrons over there. We stuck the boards in the cauldrons and then uh, got them hot and then we then got some boiling water and we just made this log form here with some logs in there and just started pouring boiling water on them and gradually bent them down and we have them weighted and staked here and there 
and now they have to be fastened together with these little crossbars in there. And, uh, and these guys are busy making those crossbars. It's all gonna be tied together with rawhide, so really this, this could all just be done with an ax and a crooked knife and an awl. When we first showed up here, this was this was mostly woods. There was one path coming back, nothing, no buildings, no clearings. And we walked around one time and just immediately knew it. We said, this is it. So over the course of the next year, before the event, we put a well in, and it just so happens that that well was an artesian well. So it flows what I think is the best water I've ever had. We built some pavilion, some, some infrastructure and some parking, and that's how this site came to be. We have a lot of artists here, and these artists are producing some of the finest art in the, in, in the world that with, within these mediums. And we have a camp store. Anyone is welcome to sell anything in the camp store. We have evening activities as well. We try to schedule an evening activity every night. We always have a featured performer, and uh, we try to pick a, a very folky band that has a, has a really good sound, and it's all acoustic. We don't have any electricity here except generators that we occasionally fire up. This year we're doing what's called a poetry sweat, which is basically a creative writing and performance class. We try to make it really affordable. We are a 5013C nonprofit, so this event is not here to make money. Money. This event is here to further our mission, and our mission is to preserve the, the land, arts, and cultures of the Great Lakes and beyond, but with a specific focus on the Great Lakes. This is a, a, a chance to learn some skills that you probably won't find anywhere else in a, in a very beautiful, pristine location in the Northwoods on an island where you have nothing else to do but learn these skills. Here's a look at what's going on in the UP. The Cabela's Master Walleye Circuit returns to the world-class waters of Little Beatty Knock, July 31st and August 1st. Two full days of competition on both Big and Little Bay's Knock, along with the adjoining Michigan waters of Lake Michigan. Little Beatty Knock has also been selected to host the 2016 Cabela's National Team Championship, which draws hundreds of grassroots walleye anglers from across North America. And it's the Wood Tech Music Festival, July 30th through August 2nd in the Hermansville Powers area. Four days of country, rock, bluegrass, and folk. Find out more at woodtechfestival.com. Plan on a trip to the Munising area on August 8th for Grand Island Day. This year marks the 25th anniversary of Grand Island National Recreation Area's designation by Congress. The event will feature free public entrance, passenger ferry service, and on-island transportation. Enjoy the island's scenic and cultural sites, highlighted by special interpretive programs with experts stationed around the tour loop.
That's feeling good. That was really fun to have that opportunity to uh, make such an interesting canoe in this day and age, and uh, be able to uh, buy, a, you know, a bond with a number of people uh, that uh, were dedicated to the project to see it through and see the the end product and in, enjoy the ride on the water. So uh, it was a success.